Hi, it's Lindley Oz. And before you watch the program here, I just wanted to make a quick mention. If the Lord moves you to give to the Lindley Oz ministry, the information is posted below the video. You can give via PayPal, and my email address is lindleyoz at freedomnationnews.com. And actually, the link to the PayPal is hyperlinked below this video. If you're uncomfortable with PayPal, you're welcome to send a gift via my P.O. Box to Lindley Oz Ministries, P.O. Box 727, Springboro, Ohio, 45066. And that information, too, will be posted below the video. Again, your help is greatly appreciated. And to those of you who have been helping to support my ministry, I just want to tell you how much I greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much for your gifts. And to all of you, thank you for your prayers. Thank you and God Hi, bless this you. This is Lynn Liaz, and I have Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat with me today, coming to us from Tel Aviv, Israel. And he has a very powerful testimony. And there's so much that we want to talk about that we are going to do several programs. This will be part one. But I read Zev's powerful testimony on his website, which is Messiah of Israel Ministries.org. And I will include that below the video. It'll be hyperlinked. And on the screen, I encourage you all to go check him out and read his testimony there as well. And there's a lot of other information. So be sure to check it out. Zev, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to finally have you on. I know we've been trying to connect for a while. Well, thank you, Lynn, for having me. It's an honor and a blessing to be here, all in his timing. Amen, amen. Well, Zev, you have an extremely powerful testimony. I've read your entire testimony on your website. Unfortunately, we don't have you know the whole time to be able to share the whole testimony, so we're going to try to squeeze in what we can until our next program next week. But why don't you go ahead and begin to share that testimony with the listeners? Because I feel it is so powerful and very encouraging to those who are listening out there. Well, I always like to say that it's not really not my testimony. It's Jesus' testimony, Yeshua. And uh, because really he transformed my life and it's all about him. Uh, I grew up in a family of rabbis. My grandfather, my, uh, my father, my ancestors were all rabbis. And a rabbi, of course, is a spiritual leader. Uh, in, in Judaism, not believers, and this is uh, who my family was. If you take, for example, uh, Judas in the Bible, who was given 30 pieces of silver to, to betray Jesus, the Sanhedrin, those were my family members. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. He made it to Israel in the middle of 1946, and in 1948, when Israel became a, a nation, he was selected to be one of the 14 head Sanhedrin rabbis in the rabbinical movement of Israel. Uh, he uh, continued the family tradition. My father then became a rabbi, and my father received a double position in, in Israel and in the United States. That's where I picked up my English from because I was born in Israel. But as a boy, I used to travel to the States at least four times a year uh, in order to be with my father, and that's where I picked up the English from, but my mother tongue is still Hebrew. Eventually, uh, my father was also uh, the principal of a... Hebrew day school, religious day school, and the main rabbi of the synagogue. And I went to that school until about junior high. And I, you, you would think that I would have an easy life, but my father made me an example always. I was always the rabbi's son, and I had to be an example. Eventually, my father uh, wanted me to go to Emic, downtown Los Angeles, to study over there in a very, very orthodox uh, rabbinic school. I went there. And I have to tell you, I, I couldn't handle it. They put us in a room for 11 hours a day with a very small window and just a few breaks. And all we did was study these rabbinic books, you know, the Talmud, the Zohar, the oral Torah, like the rabbis like to teach. And uh, I went to my father and I said, look, I, I can't handle this. You need to understand, I grew up, I was always told that I'm going to be a rabbi. But I never wanted to be a rabbi. I, I never felt the presence of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was always told that uh, I have a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I remember one time when I was in Israel, I walked into my grandfather's house and I accidentally turned on the light on the Sabbath and my grandfather almost had a heart attack. It was always like glorify the Sabbath and I never felt that presence and I was forced into trying to be a, 
religious Jew. And when I went to public school for a few months a year, you thought my life would be easier there, but it wasn't because I was the rabbi's son and I couldn't do anything. Uh, eventually, my father passed away in the United States and by his request uh, was sent to, be, to Israel to be buried in a rabbinic cemetery, which is located in uh, Israel, Bnei Brak, which is an Orthodox rabbinic cemetery for rabbis. And my grandfather, the head of the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Pinchas Porat, became like a father to me. And I remember I went to my grandfather and I said, I want to be drafted to the Israeli army. And because I grew up and you love your country and you want to go to the army. And my grandfather said, you're not going to the army. And you, how is it I can't go to the army? I mean, it's, it's a law in Israel. In Israel, it is not a choice. If you're 18, 19 years old and you're healthy, you have to go to the Israeli army. But one thing I want to bring out here, and it's very important for the listeners to know this, um, in Israel, the government is not the one that's in full control, the Sanhedrin are, the rabbinic movement. So when you see on television Benjamin Netanyahu and you think he's the prime minister of Israel and he's in control of everything, the Sanhedrin are running the show behind the scenes. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. And my grandfather said, you're not going. Well, I begged my grandfather to go. And he said, you know what, if you leave the army twice a week and complete your Sanhedrin rabbi certificate, I'll allow you to go to the army. So my grandfather picked up the phone. I don't know who he called. And in two minutes, uh, I was able to uh, get an agreement to be drafted into the Israeli army. And two times a week, I would be released at two o'clock in the afternoon to go to the Ponovich Yeshiva, which is a school for rabbis and complete my rabbinic studies and become an authorized Sanhedrin rabbi in Israel. We go to the army in Israel for three years, but after two years I completed uh, the study and became an authorized Sanhedrin rabbi in Israel. I then finished the Israeli army, I shaved off my beard, I took off my black clothes, and I started drifting away from being an Orthodox Jew. I, I, I put on a, a knitted yarmulke, kippa, which means I'm traditional, and I used to go to my grandfather's house and put on that yarmulke. And as soon as I left, I took it off because I really didn't want to be a, a rabbi. And I, I got myself a very good job because in, I speak English and Hebrew well, so I, I was able to obtain a very good job as a, a manager at a medical company managing 37 workers. I earned five times more of the average salary. I had a new car, everything was paid for, but I still wasn't happy. And I decided the reason I'm not happy it's because I need a bigger car. I need a bigger house. I need some diamonds, and then I'll be happy. And in my quest for happiness, I went and found another extra job working in a hotel twice a week as, as a manager. And one day, a group from China walks into this hotel. They came to Israel for a food exhibition, and this is where I met my wife, Lynn. And to make a long story short, the group went back to China, Lynn stayed in Israel, and we got married after 10 months. Now, this is something supernatural, because the grandson of a Sanhedrin rabbi doesn't marry a Gentile. And second of all, what was even more uh, supernatural was that Lynn, my wife, was from a Buddha background. She was a heavy Buddha religious woman. And I want to give you a picture of what our house looked like when we got married. On one side of the house, we had rabbi pictures here. And on this side of the house, we had a big, fat Buddha doll. And Lynn, my wife, would pray to that doll five times a day. Now, that's true that I wasn't an Orthodox Jew anymore, but I was in the culture, and I still took what the rabbis have to say at face value. So we had a dark house in Israel. And eventually what happened was I decided to go look for happiness on the Internet because I was still miserable. I didn't find it in money. I didn't find it. Uh, working in an extra company. I, I didn't find it having a big car. And I decided that I know where I'm going to find happiness. And I went to the Internet. And in, in the Internet, in a very unpleasant chat room, a man from California by the name of Todd found me. And he found out that I'm from Israel. And he started to preach the gospel to me. And I got very angry with him. I said, I'm a Jew. Don't speak to me about the New Testament. And I came here to run away from God. Leave me alone. Well, you can't run away from God. When God has a calling in your life, it will come to pass. God will find you on the Internet. He'll find you in the supermarket. He'll find you in the post office. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. 
And this man, Todd, God sent the right person because he knew how to preach the gospel from the Old Testament, how to preach Jesus, Yeshua. And I was listening to this man on the internet for four years, almost on a daily basis, four years. And you have to ask yourself, why would I listen to him for four years? Well, I tried to delete him several times. One time I tried to delete him and the computer screen just burnt out. Another time the light bulb just went out. You can't run away from God. But something happened. After two years out of the four years of listening to this man Todd on the internet, God started to wake me up at night. Three o'clock in the morning and God is speaking to me. Isaiah 53, Micah 5.2, Jeremiah 23, all these Bible verses that Todd was witnessing, they began to sink in and the enemy attacked me. And he said, Zeb, even if this is the Messiah, it's not the Jewish Messiah, it's the Gentile Messiah. And it was easy for me to buy the lie. You're praying for Israel, you wanna know what to pray about, you pray about strong spiritual warfare. It is not easy for anybody, but especially for a Jew, to embrace Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. And God said, I'm not gonna wake you up anymore. I'm not gonna wake you up anymore. I'm not gonna let you sleep. And then what happened was, I went to do an investigation in Israel. I interviewed 32 rabbis in Israel, 33 with my grandfather, and I received 26 different answers for the same question. The question was Micha 5, Micah 5, 2, which says a birth of a king in Bethlehem. You really were going through a lot and God was really trying to get your attention. And I just, I'm always amazed at your story because I've read your story on your website actually twice. And it is just so powerful. And some even more powerful things happen um, in your life at that point. Why don't you tell the listener what those things were? So I interviewed these 32 rabbis and my grandfather. I walked into my grandfather's house with the Old Testament. I never once mentioned, mentioned the word Mashiach, Messiah. And, and I want to point out to the listeners, you were very close to your grandpa. You were closer to him than anyone else. He, you just loved him dearly. He was like your favorite person. You had this great respect and love for him. Well, I grew up with him, and, and he was like a father to me. And absolutely, he was, when my father passed away, he replaced my father. And I, I never called him grandfather. I actually called him father. That's true. We had a very, very close relationship, so it was very difficult when uh, when he disowned me. And I, wa I walked into his house. I never once mentioned the word Messiah to him. All I did was show him Bible verses, like Isaiah 53 and other Bible verses. And my grandfather, he was 86 years old, was getting very nervous. Why was my grandfather getting nervous from an Old Testament? And it was a red light for me. I knew there was something wrong. Why is he getting nervous from these Bible verses? And um, I then went on to interview the main rabbi of Israel. So I'm four years on the internet. I finished two years of investigation with rabbis and I still won't embrace Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. I then decide to go and do an investigation to interview the main rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Israel Lau. Today his son David Lau is the main rabbi of Israel. And how did I get an appointment with him? Well, he was very close to my family and he actually bar mitzvahed me. So it was very easy for me to get an appointment with him. So I walked into Rabbi Lau's office and I asked him a very simple question. I said, I interviewed 32 rabbis in Israel and my grandfather. I received 26 different answers for the same question. Isn't there one Bible? And you know, the answer he gave me, I knew right there that Jesus is the Messiah. He said, Yeshivim Banim la Torah. There are 70 faces to the Bible, meaning there's 70 different answers. So the fact that you received 26 is okay. You've got a long way to go. I knew right there that Jesus, Yeshua, was the Messiah. But I knew it in my, in my mind. I wouldn't accept it in my heart. And the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, that God will write the, the word, the Torah, on our hearts. It's not a mind issue. It's a heart issue. And I wasn't willing to accept him in my heart. Because when I want people to understand, when I was in his office right there, I saw a video of my whole life. How do you accept that most of your life was a lie? If I do embrace this Jesus, this Yeshua, as the Messiah, what kind of a price am I going to pay? I might lose my job. I might be disowned. You see, when a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit, he has a spirit of fear and he thinks he's going to lose everything. It's only later 
after we become believers that we understand that we gained everything. And I said, no, I won't accept it. I left his office. I was miserable. And I said, I'm not going to accept this Messiah. He's not the Jewish Messiah. He's the Gentile Messiah. And I, and I just left it at that. Now the, next, well, now, the next night, you had an intense experience that changed your life forever on this issue. And God really did come to you and speak to you. And it's powerful. So why yeah. don't, yeah, why don't you tell the listeners what that experience was? Because it's, it's, it's the main experience, I think, from what I read, that really had the, the most impact on you. It was two nights later. It was a cold winter night in Israel. I was sleeping. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. My bed was all wet. I was awake. God speaks to me from a cloud, a shiny cloud. Looking back now, I believe it was the same cloud that hovered over Israel when they were freed from bondage in Egypt. And he called my name two times in Hebrew. He said, Zev, Zev, Ishayahu, Nun Gimel, is a Mashiach for Israel, which translates Zev, Zev, Isaiah 53, is the Messiah of Israel. It's true. I was shaking all over. Uh, I felt electricity just going through my body. Uh, supernatural experience. I knew right there that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. I knew that I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And he came and he, and he died for my sins. He rose after three days. I knew, I understood right there that being Jewish is not a ticket to heaven, but the ticket to heaven is only Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, who said it with his own mouth. No one makes it to the Father, but only through me. I was born again. It was the first time in my life that I felt God inside of me. Supernatural experience. I immediately woke up my wife, Lynn. I said, Lynn, I, God spoke to me. I know who the Messiah is. And her reaction was, go back to bed. It's the guy from the internet brainwashing you. But praise God, you know, the Bible says that the Jews are stiff-necked, and that's an understatement. It took me four years to embrace Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. My wife, I preached the gospel to her, and one week later, she accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as her personal Savior. And right there, we just went, our, we took the rabbi pictures off the wall, we took that big fat Buddha doll, and we smashed it in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, we broke off all generational curses in the name of Jesus. And the dark house in Israel became a house of the Shekinah glory, the one new man, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. And, you know, I was, I was on fire. I still am on fire. They say a new believer is on fire. Well, I'm an old believer and I'm still on fire. I wanted every Jew to know that Jesus is the Messiah. And I started off with my own family. I called my mom up and I said, Mom, I know who the Messiah is. And she said, who? And I said, Yeshua, Jesus. When my mom heard that name, Yeshua, she lost her mind. She said, your father is twisting and turning in the grave for what you have done. You are no longer a part of this family. You are no longer a Jew. You are a backstabber. And then she said something to me that, you know, until this day, I'm, I'm, I'm just shocked by it. She said, you're worse than a terrorist that blows up buses. Because a terrorist believes in what he's doing. He's not a traitor. You're a traitor. This is my own mom telling me this. And um, she just closed the phone. I then moved on to my grandfather, the head of the Sanhedrin in Israel. And I walked into my grandfather's house and I said, Grandfather, do you remember I spoke to you about some Bible verses? And he said, yes. I said, I know who it is. And when I said the name Yeshua, Jesus, my grandfather was not my grandfather anymore. I've never seen anything like it in my life. He stood up. He had the power of a man 30. There was like a glass window behind him with like a silverware and China, China silverware. And he took these plates and he started to throw them at me like this. And he said, goy, goy. And I have to tell you, it wasn't the physical pain. It was a spiritual pain. And I remember I just left his house. And it was only when I went, my whole shirt is full of blood. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but I have a, a real mark here, a, a scar from the plates that hit me uh, from the stitches. I never saw my grandfather again. I had one opportunity. I called my grandfather up, and this is what he said. He said, Zev, don't you ever call this family again. You are no longer a Jew. You are a dead man until you deny the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua. And I told my grandfather, I will never deny the name of Yeshua, Jesus. And I never saw my grandfather again. It was the last time I ever heard of him. 
And I, I have a sister. Uh, she's an Orthodox sister. She lives in the city of Rehovot, which is about 20 minutes uh, south of Tel Aviv. She's, uh, of course, very Orthodox and the granddaughter of an Orthodox rabbi. Of course, her husband is a rabbi. And they had seven kids at that time. Orthodox Jews have a lot of kids. And I remember I took, I, I drove down over there to see them. And uh, I had one opportunity to preach the gospel to them. I preached Psalms 2. Psalms 2 is a very powerful Messianic chapter. It deals with God and his anointed. It shows the deity of Jesus, of Yeshua. And Psalms 2.12 says, blessed are those who uh, kiss the son and blessed are those who take refuge in him. So very, it's very powerful. And when I shared that Bible verse with Rabbi Avi, her husband, and my sister Sigal, this is what he said. He said, you can't read the Bible like this. You think it says son, but it doesn't. You need to read the Bible under rabbinic interpretations. If you read the Bible like this, you might die. And in a way, they were right, because in every lie, there's a little bit of truth. If you read Psalms 2, you will die, but you'll rise again with Yeshua HaMashiach. And I never, ever saw my sister ever again. I never saw my seven nephews ever again. In fact, they were so scared that I believe in Jesus and Yeshua that they subpoenaed me to the rabbinic courts in Jerusalem. They wanted to get an injunction against me that I can't get within 100 meters to their, uh, to their house and I can't call them. They were so scared that their children would hear about Yeshua that they wanted to get an injunction against me. Well, I wrote the rabbis back. I said, I'm not coming to your court because I'm not under your law, I'm under Yeshua's law. They would crucify me either way. Yeshua said, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. And I never, ever uh, saw my sister ever again. In fact, if you ask my go to Israel today and you ask my sister where I am, she doesn't say that I'm a believer in Jesus. She says that I died. My brother died and that's it. So uh, we just pray for, for their salvation. But uh, basically my family disowned me. And remember I told you I had a very good job and I was uh, working a, in a medical company. I was managing 37 workers. Well, for the first two years of being a new believer in Jesus, every day, at five o'clock, I would just go out and preach the gospel everywhere. And I remember after two years of doing this, I got called in by the CEO of the company. And he said, Zeb, I've been hearing bad things about you. You've been talking about this guy, Jesus, Yeshua. And, and Jews that don't believe in, in Yeshua usually don't say the word Yeshua. They have a curse word that the rabbis invented. I don't want to say that here, but that's the word he used. And I said, look, look Rafi, his name was Rafi. I don't preach the gospel at work. I share my faith after work. And he says, I won't have it. And I asked him, are you asking me to deny the name of, of Yeshua, Jesus? And he said, yes. And I said, I will never deny the name of Yeshua. And right there at, the, at that moment, what he did was he terminated my job. He said, you are fired. You are not gonna get compensation. You're not gonna get a salary. You're not gonna get a pension. You're to go back to your office. You are to clear your desk. You are to leave the job immediately. And look, I, I have to tell you, I was angry. I was a new believer, only two years. I was going to get this guy for what he did. I was going to sue him in the labor courts. But God spoke to me as I was going to sue him in the labor courts. And he said, vengeance is mine. He spoke to me, Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Vengeance is mine. And I understood that God is telling me not just to let it go, but to pray for this man's salvation. God was teaching me what it means not just to read the Bible, but what it means to live the Bible. And I had a new obstacle right now. I had to look for a new job. How do you look for a new job without a resume, without a resume, without a recommendation? Well, I started going to every to many manpower companies in Israel and applying for a job. In every place I went, I, I wrote on my application that I was fired because I believe in Yeshua, I believe in Jesus. And they all said, We don't care what you believe, we'll we'll call you but they never called. One month passed, three months passed, five months passed, and they never called. What you need to understand is that not only didn't I get a salary from, from this company or compensation, but the savings that I had, I had a huge amount of savings, that company was also holding, and they wouldn't release it. And I couldn't go to the, what we call in Israel, the social security system to get like, uh, like welfare when you get fired from work, because the law says in Israel, that you have to have a note from your employee. And I didn't have a note, so I couldn't get any money. And my wife, Lynn, was working just a little bit as a cook. She didn't know any Hebrew at that time. And the little money that we had was being eaten up slowly, slowly. Seven months passed, 11 months. 
and I still can't find a job. And as I'm praying, God speaks to me. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 10. A man who doesn't work shall not eat. And I understood right there that God is speaking to me and telling me, if you can't find a qualified job, then you find any job because every job is a blessing. And I went and I found a job that no one cares what you believe. No one needs your resume. I went from work for managing 37 workers and earning a huge salary and having all my bills paid to working as a dishwasher. The Bible says in the book of John chapter three, verse 30, we must decrease in order to increase. Yeshua said, if anybody wishes to follow me, he must pick up his cross, the tree, and deny himself. God was taking me through the fire. He was preparing me for something big, something big because we're small people with a big God. So I'm working as a dishwasher, and I'm sure that the listeners around the world and also you have experienced God's sense of humor because God does have a sense of humor. Because when I went to work as a dishwasher, my manager was an Arab. And when I was stationed in, uh, in reserves, reserves is when we finished the Israeli army, we'd go on for 30 days a year, I was stationed near Lebanon border. And I had an opportunity over there to exercise my hatred towards the Arabs. And God was going to teach me what it means, Matthew 5.44, to love your enemies. This manager, Ali, hated the Jewish people. And he finally had a Jew under his hand washing dishes. And every day I would go into that job and he would scream at me, faster, faster, faster. God was really teaching me what it means to love your enemies. That was a very, very difficult situation. That That is a powerful story. And in fact, you have a lot more to share, but we are about out of time here. But I am so glad we were able to finally connect and get this story out to the people listening. I believe wholeheartedly there are many listening uh, to this who are going to come to the knowledge of who Yeshua is and that it is going to increase the faith of those who are really struggling right now. And, and I just believe there's going to be so much blessing um, upon the people once they hear your powerful testimony. But I would like to find out before we close here, and I'm going to have you back next week to share the rest of your testimony, but I wanted to find out what do you want to leave the listeners with? What is, what is Yeshua laying on your heart right now uh, to leave everybody with before we go? Well, first of all, as I like to say, it's, it's Yeshua's testimony. It's not my testimony. and We're just getting, uh, getting into the heart of it, so it's going to get much more interesting as we, as we speak about it next week. What I want to tell the people is, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you went through. It doesn't matter what you're going to go through. You have victory in Yeshua HaMashiach. And things may look like, okay, if I embrace Jesus, if I seek first the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to be disowned. People are going to mock me. It may seem like that. That's what the enemy wants you to think. But once you embrace him and really embrace him, not just in knowledge, with your whole heart, that's when the supernatural blessing gets released. And I think the enemy knows that. He doesn't want us to be blessed. And I'm telling you, once you embrace Jesus wholehearted and you seek first the kingdom and you start proclaiming the promises of the Bible, we have to proclaim it. We have to shout it out. That's when the glory begins to come and our life gets transformed. And it doesn't matter what you're going through. If it's a health problem, a marriage problem, a financial problem, God takes care of everything. But he's got to be, you've got to seek his kingdom, you know, the kingdom first and have full faith in him. So my message is to those who don't believe in Jesus, Jews and non-Jews around the world, it's time to turn to him now. We are, the world's going crazy. Now is the time to turn to Yeshua. To those who believe in Jesus and are afraid to come out and proclaim it or think that, you know, the, the miracles were 2,000 years ago and they stopped. They need to remember that the word of God, Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his promises are forever. And therefore, what he did 2,000 years ago applies to us today. Amen. That is that is so awesome, and that is so true that, you know, there is always forgiveness. And if you're out there listening right now and you've been caught up in things um, that are ungodly or you have just kind of walked away from the Lord or you're stuck in something and you feel like there's no way out, Whatever the case may be, 
Yeshua is waiting on you to just come to him. He's standing there. His arms are open and he's waiting for you to come back. And he wants to help you through whatever this struggle is. But you need to really just trust in him and come to him today before it's too late. And we don't know, um, you know, when when things are really going to happen as far as Yeshua coming back. We know we don't know when, but we know based on what's going on in the world, it's going to be soon. And we also don't know when our last breath might take place. It could be later today. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be any time. And I just encourage everyone out there to get close to Yeshua and to just repent, come to the cross today and repent and just give your life to Yeshua. So I want to give out that website again, and the information will be hyperlinked below the video. It will also be on the screen for you to see. Make sure that you share this videos with other people so they can be blessed and uh, visit Messiah of Israel ministries.org and check out Zev's story and check out all the other information he has there. And Zev, you wanted to say one more thing before we go. And what was that? Uh, you mentioned forgiveness. And one thing I've learned over, as believers in Jesus and Yeshua, we don't have room for unforgiveness. There's no room for unforgiveness in the life of a godly man and a godly woman. When you and I accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah, we gave up our right not to forgive. But if somebody's out there and he's not embracing Jesus or he's back slid from from being a believer in Jesus because of lack of forgiveness, uh, I, I encourage you to forgive because forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about you. It's about releasing your blessing. And uh, that's what it's all about. It's, it's That's what I've learned over the years. My grandfather, as I said, was a Holocaust survivor. I grew up my whole life, you know, hating what the Germans did. I realized later on that it was done in the name of Jesus, but they weren't believers. And not only did I forgive, but right, right now my best friends and ministry partners and uh, and people that I do ministry with are from are from German. And my message is forgiveness and love. So if we can forgive those that massacre our family, you can forgive anybody because Jesus paid it all on the cross on the tree. Amen. That is so true. And I think forgiveness, in my personal opinion, is one of the biggest things that really keeps us from getting close to Yeshua. And it causes so much uh, bad in our lives when we harbor unforgiveness against other people. And sometimes, interestingly enough, there's a person that we never really think about that we're harboring unforgiveness against, and that can be ourselves. Because you know, those of you listening, you are a person too, and you also have to forgive yourself. So very powerful. Well, Rabbi, I just want to thank you so much for coming on my show. And I can't wait to have you back next week. And, you know, God bless you for everything you're doing. God bless your family, your ministry, and just all that you do. And you are just, you're just such a blessed man. And, and I just appreciate having you on and you're sharing this with everybody so they can be blessed by um, your experiences. Well, thank you, and uh, praise God, and thank you for all you're doing for the kingdom and getting the message out, and I think it's very important. Well, thank you, and I look forward to having you back next week. Everybody listening, once again, that is messiahofisraelministries.org. Be sure and check them out. And once again, if you're not subscribed, subscribe today. Click the little bell below the subscribe button for the updates and share this video all over the place so other people can be blessed. Thanks, uh, Rabbi, and God bless you. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom.